You certainly don't want to hear about the Scottsboro boys, do you? This could give you goosebumps and cold feet all day just hearing about it. It's just crazy, unbelievable to hear the extent to which the cruelty of white segregatory policies did literally waste away the precious lives and days of innocent blacks in those dark eras. It was indeed merciless. Even children were not spared. The lives of the Scottsboro boys were literally snatched away from them so that they did nothing useful with the whole of their lives, seized and thrown into prison in an age yet as tender and innocent as 12 years old, snatched away from their mother's warm embrace, stolen from their daddy's arms, facing trials like grown men caught in a murderous crime, the Scottsboro boys would be carried back and forth year after year from one court to another until their hairs would turn gray. Yes, you heard correctly. The Scottsboro boys case had continued in court until these young teens grew into old men in prison, doing nothing more with their lives, which leaves us with the very questions. Is it such a difficult thing to look through a simple case of social conflict and set the record straight? How could a case as fickle as some conflict between youngsters chew away more than a hundred years? And what was the crime of those prosecuted, by the way? The case of the Scottsboro boys, which lasted more than a hundred years, was the outcome of nothing other than a mere childish brawl between young teenagers. The affair of the Scottsboro boys was indeed so infamous that it helped spur the civil rights movement and inspired several prominent activists and organizers. To Kill a Mockingbird, the Pulitzer Prize winning novel by white author Harper Lee is also loosely based on the case. On March the 25th, 1931, nine African-American teenagers who were aboard a Southern Railroad freight train in Northern Alabama in search of employment were involved in a racially charged fight which had broken out between them and some white passengers, after which they were accused of raping two white women. The original cases were tried in Scottsboro, Alabama. Only four of the young African-American men knew each other prior to the incident on the freight train, but as the trials drew increasing regional and national attention, they would become known as the Scottsboro Boys. Journey with us in this video as we unfold one of America's darkest chapters in its history of oppression, segregatory policies, and hateful denial of the black man, woman, and child. Before we continue, remember to offer support by hitting the thumb button, share this history with friends and families, and subscribe to stay tuned in. All right, let's get back on track. The Scottsboro Boys case was indeed evil, one which the United States may have pretended to prosecute, but the true motive was to seize yet another chance to destroy the lives of yet another black children. Olin Montgomery, one of the children arrested, who seemed to have made it through fifth grade and was the only defendant who could write at the time of their arrest, had once written in one of his letters, I was on my way to Memphis on an oil tank by myself alone, and I was not worried with anyone until I got to Paint Rock, Alabama, and they just made a frame up on us boys just because they could. This had all begun when a young white male would step on the hand of one of the black boys in the train, Haywood Patterson. This would in turn lead to a heated argument between six white travelers on the train and the African-Americans in it. The heated argument would reach a boiling point that did inevitably lead to a fight, which, in a quick moment as the rumble erupted, the black riders and white travelers would be locked in a power struggle. In the end, the black riders had overpowered the white travelers forcing them all off the train. Enraged, the defeated white travelers would conjure a falsehood on the African-Americans as usual. They would go to the nearby town in Alabama where the train was scheduled to stop and file a complaint alleging assault. Upon the train's arrival in Paint Rock, Alabama, the sheriff assembled a mob consisting of white men. They seized and arrested all the African-Americans who were on board. Eventually, they were able to narrow the case to nine African-American boys in the train, while the rest were freed. In addition, two white women, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates, who were also on the freight train at the time of the event, approached authorities and claimed they had been raped by the nine boys after the white boys had been kicked off the train. By claiming they were rape victims, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates successfully shifted the focus away from their own troubled pasts, which included prostitution, and pending charges of vagrancy and illegal sexual activity, as they had both been involved in a prostitution case in Tennessee. Both women were later taken to be examined by Dr. Robert Russell Bridges and Dr. Marvin Lynch, 
who were physicians in Tennessee. While the nine boys were arrested and taken to the nearest jail, the local county seat in Scottsboro, Alabama, to await trial. News of the incident spread quickly like wildfire. The Jackson County Sentinel, printed that evening, decries the revolting crime. White outrage erupted over the allegations, and a lynch mob gathers at the Scottsboro jail, prompting the sheriff to call Alabama Governor Benjamin Meeks Miller. Governor Miller, in turn, calls in the National Guard to protect the jail and its prisoners. The nine boys, Roy Wright, age 12, Haywood Patterson, age 18, Olin Montgomery, age 17, Clarence Norris, age 19, Willie Robertson, age 15, Andy Wright, age 19, Ozzie Powell, age 16, Eugene Williams, age 13, and Charlie Weems, age 20, had their lives altered and snatched away from them by one train drive. On March 30th, a grand jury indicted all nine boys, and on April 6, 1931, Judge Alfred Eugene Hawkins tried the cases of three of the boys. On that day, a crowd of over 10,000 people crowded the court in the small town of Scottsboro, whose normal population was not more than 2,000. After a series of intense interrogations, the three boys, Clarence Norris and Charlie Weems, were convicted and sentenced to death. The judge and prosecutor wanted to speed the nine trials to avoid intense violence, so the trial of the first three boys took a day and a half, and the rest took place one right after the other, making the entire trial last for four days. That same month, the boys were later transferred to Kilby Prison in Montgomery, Alabama, due to issues of overcrowding and safety concerns stemming from the highly publicized and racially charged nature of the case. Kilby Prison, a maximum security facility, provided tighter control and monitoring. The transfer also brought the defendants closer to the Alabama Court of Appeals, facilitating their ongoing legal battles. At Kilby Prison, the Scottsboro boys faced harsh conditions including overcrowding, poor sanitation, physical labor, and racial segregation. This would mark the beginning of a most lengthy and complex legal process. The nine boys, being underage, had no idea on what it takes to handle a capital case. More so, they had received no competent counsel, so they were barely prepared for the task. They were provided with the services of two lawyers, Stephen Roddy, a real lawyer from Tennessee, who was there at the request of the friends of the boys' parents and was unfamiliar with Alabama's law, and the public defender, Milo Moody, a 69-year-old retired lawyer who had not practiced in years. After swift trials, with outrageous testimony from the accusers, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates, the all-white jury quickly convicted the boys and sentenced eight of them to death by electric chair. According to the jury's order, they were scheduled to die on July 10, 1931, even after the report from the doctors who had examined the women claimed that no rape had occurred. The trial of the youngest of the boys, 12 years old Leroy Wright, ended in a hung jury, not because he was assumed innocent, but the judge granted him the mistrial because of his age. Despite the recommendation of the all-white jury, the judge favored life imprisonment rather than death. A mistrial was declared, and Leroy Wright remained in prison until 1937, awaiting the final verdict on his co-defendants. The proclamation of this verdict and sentence brought a storm of charges from outside the South, alleging a blatant miscarriage of justice that had occurred in Scottsboro. After a series of rallies and protests in Harlem, the Communist Party, the International Labor Defense, ILD, the legal wing of the American Communist Party and other human rights organizations looked into the case of the boys, seeing its potential to galvanize public opinion against racism. Most of these organizations sent telegram texts to Alabama's governor, Benjamin Meek Miller, stating that the young men had been framed and were victims of legal lynching. The International Labor Defense, ILD, spearheaded a national campaign to help free the nine young men including rallies, speeches, parades, and demonstrations. Letters streamed in from various people, communists and non-communists, white and black, protesting the guilty verdicts. In the heat of this, the ILD employed the services of attorneys George W. Chamley and Joseph Brodsky. Chamley moved for new trials for the defendants while private investigations took place. It was at this junction that they discovered that Price and Bates had been prostitutes in Tennessee who regularly serviced both black and white clients. Chamley, in an attempt to prove his point, provided Judge Hawkins' affidavit to that effect, 
but it was swept underneath the carpet and forbade them from reading it out in the court. The ILD launched a national effort to win support for the nine boys. The defense team argued before the Alabama Supreme Court that their clients had not been given adequate representation and had insufficient time for counsel to prepare their cases. Also, they claimed that the juries had been intimidated by the crowd and most crucially, that it was unconstitutional for blacks to have been excluded from the jury. That June, the court granted the boys a stay of execution pending an appeal to the Alabama Supreme Court. The teens would grow into men while enduring decades of courtroom trials, convictions, retrials, and incarceration, and the associated physical trauma and mental anguish, even after one of the women had admitted that they made up the rape claim to avoid getting in trouble with the police. And how many times have whites told falsehoods just for the sake of getting blacks killed. History has it that most of the worst mass killings and race riots ever to occur in American history were products of mere lies against blacks, falsehoods born of envy, hatred and jealousy, callously told for no reason other than just to see the black man or woman down, hurt and trodden on, nothing more, nothing less. What happened to the Scottsboro boys was just another one of those scenarios. While awaiting trial, Clarence Norris, one of the blacks incarcerated wrote, I am alone, out to myself. No one to say a kind word to me. Just listen to the other people away from me. However, in March 1932, the Alabama Supreme Court, in a six to one voting, upheld the convictions of seven of the defendants, granting Eugene Williams a new trial because he was still a minor at the time of his conviction. The court denied the defendants a new trial citing that there was no contention from the defense that the alleged victim had consented to sexual intercourse, implying that the issue of consent was not disputed. The case was further appealed before the United States Supreme Court on October 10, 1932, with the International Labor Defense retaining the services of Walter Pollack, who represented the boys, and Thomas E. Knight, the Attorney General of Alabama, who represented the state. Pollack's duty was to contend that the defendants had been denied due process firstly because of the mob atmosphere, secondly because of the wrongful appointment of attorneys and their inadequate performance at trial, and lastly, that African Americans were systematically excluded from jury duty, contrary to the 14th Amendment. On the other hand, Thomas E. Knight countered the fact that there had been a mob atmosphere at the trial, also maintaining that the trial was fair and representative. In an opinion by Associate Justice George Sutherland, he found the defendants to have been denied effective counsel he delivered the majority opinion, stating that the defendants had been denied effective counsel. The right to be heard would be, in many cases, of little avail if it did not comprehend the right to be heard by counsel. Even the intelligent and educated layman has small and sometimes no skill in the science of law, says George Sutherland. Later in November 1932, the Supreme Court overturned the Alabama verdicts on the grounds that the defendants had not received adequate legal counsel in a capital case. This set an important legal precedent for enforcing the right of black Americans to adequate counsel, and the case was then remanded to the lower courts. The Supreme Court did not criticize attorney Milo Moody and attorney Stephen Roddy for inadequate defense, recognizing that they had informed Judge Hawkins of insufficient time to prepare their cases. Instead, the Supreme Court identified the hastened trial proceedings as the primary issue. This conclusion did not find the Scottsboro boys innocent, but ruled that the procedures violated their rights due to the process under the 14th and 15th Amendments, and the Supreme Court sent the case back to Judge Hawkins for retrial. The second round of trials had begun in the Circuit Court in Decatur, Alabama, 50 miles west of Scottsboro, under Judge James Horton on the 27th of the month of March, the following year, 1933. Patterson's case was tried first, since it was regarded as more severe at the time. Haywood Patterson was accused of rape and assault, with the prosecution emphasizing these charges and relying heavily on testimony from his accusers, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates. The alleged victims, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates, had identified Patterson as one of the primary perpetrators, and this carried significant weight in the trial, although a proven falsehood. The prosecutors then presented him as a ringleader, emphasizing his alleged involvement to the jury. However, this narrative was contested by the defense, who highlighted inconsistencies in the accuser's accounts and the lack of concrete physical evidence. Despite these concerns, 
Judge Horton portrayed Patterson as a key defendant. His decision to try Patterson's case first reflected the prosecution's emphasis on his alleged involvement, setting the stage for a highly publicized and emotionally charged trial. But the defense attorney, Samuel Leibowitz, being well equipped and fully prepared, raised concerns about necessary issues that had been ignored by the judge. He criticized how the jury selection process was racially biased. He pointed out that no African Americans were included in the jury pool, despite making up a significant portion of the local population. Leibowitz called the jury commissioner to testify and asked if there were any African Americans on the juror rolls. The commissioner replied affirmatively, but Leibowitz questioned the accuracy of this response, implying that African Americans were intentionally excluded. This exchange highlighted systemic racial discrimination in the legal system, particularly in jury selection. By challenging the commissioner's answer, Leibowitz cast doubt on the fairness of the trial and laid groundwork for future appeals. On April 6, 1933, one of the boy's accusers, Ruby Bates, would recant her initial testimony and agree to testify for the defense, acknowledging that she and Price had been pressured into falsely accusing the Scottsboro boys. I told a lie. Those boys didn't touch me. I was scared and I told a lie. According to her, she was with Victoria Price for the whole train ride. Her assertion that she and Price were with boyfriends the night before explains the presence of semen in their vaginas. You have testified that you examined Victoria Price and Ruby Bates within a half hour of this alleged multiple rape. On the stand, Dr. Bridges admits that the sperm found in his examination were non-motile and indicates that Victoria Price showed no physical signs of having been forcibly raped by that amount of men, as she claimed, but he refuses to say how old the semen could have been. Ruby Bates had obviously decided to tell the truth, as her conscience had begun to prick at her. She couldn't shake the feeling that she had wronged the boys, who were innocent. The weight of her lie grew heavier with each passing day. After meeting with Joseph Brodsky, a Communist Party USA representative, who was advocating for the Scottsboro boys' release, Ruby's eyes were open to the truth as he shared the boys' stories and struggles, and she summoned the courage to finally speak the truth. She realized that her false accusations had destroyed lives. The boys' families suffered, and the community was torn apart by racial tensions. Ruby's guilt had consumed her. Ruby's recantation sparked both praise and backlash. She faced death threats, harassment, and rejection from her family. But she stood firm, testifying on behalf of the Scottsboro boys and advocating for their release. But even with her revised testimony and evidence from the initial medical examination, that refuted the rape charge, another all-white jury convicted the first defendant, Patterson, and recommended the death penalty on April 9, 1933, three days after Ruby Bates' testimony. Having reviewed the evidence and met privately with one of the medical examiners, Judge Horton suspended the death sentence and granted Patterson a new trial. This act of honesty would make him lose bid for re-election the following year. On October 20th, 1933, the boys' cases took a troubling turn when they were transferred from Judge James E. Horton's court to Judge William Callahan's court. This move raised concerns about potential bias, as Callahan was seen as more sympathetic to the prosecution. The following month, on November 20th, seven of the defendants appeared before Judge Callahan, while the other two youngest defendants, Roy Wright and Eugene Williams, were transferred to juvenile court. By November and December that same year, the trials of Highwood Patterson and Clarence Norris unfolded. During Patterson's trial, Judge Callahan made a startling omission. He forgot to explain to the jury how to render a not guilty verdict. Fortunately, defense attorney Samuel Leibowitz intervened, reminding Callahan to provide the critical instruction. Despite this, Patterson was convicted and sentenced to death. The bias was even more apparent in Norris's trial. Judge Callahan neglected to ask the jury to consider mercy, a customary practice. The outcome was devastating. Norris was convicted and sentenced to death, while the trials of the other defendants were postponed, as tensions in the town were running too high to expect a just and impartial verdict. With prominent defense, attorney Samuel Leibowitz argued the case for the International Labor Defense, and the Alabama Supreme Court unanimously denied the defense's motion for new trials. As a result, the case advanced to a second hearing at the U.S. Supreme Court. 
On February 15, 1935, the Supreme Court revisited the Scottsboro Boys case following heated arguments between attorneys Samuel Leibowitz, Walter H. Pollock, and Osmond Frankel regarding the composition of Jackson County jury roles. Attorney Leibowitz presented compelling evidence demonstrating that African-American names were deliberately removed from the jury roles to circumvent allegations of racial bias. Notwithstanding this attempt, the Supreme Court ruled in Norris v. Alabama that the systematic exclusion of African-Americans from the jury pool violated the defendant's right to a fair trial. The court then delivered its verdict, overturning the guilty verdicts and remanding the case back to the lower courts for further review, including Clarence Patterson's case, who was formerly given 75 years imprisonment. This second landmark decision in the Scottsboro Boys case later helped integrate future juries across the nation. The verdict also lit up a glimmer of hope in the hearts of the wrongly accused young men. The justices ruled that Jackson County's systematic exclusion of African Americans from jury roles denied the defendants a fair trial, a blatant violation of their constitutional rights. On January 24, the year 1936, a dramatic and violent incident would occur during the transportation of one of the Scottsboro boys, Ozzie Powell, back to Birmingham jail. While in custody, Powell, through some means unknown, had laid his hand on a knife which he managed to conceal. However, in a desperate bid for freedom or revenge, he would slash the throat of Edgar Blaylock, the deputy who supervised his transportation, with the knife. Seizing control of the situation, Sheriff Jay Sandlin swiftly intervened, stopping the car and shooting Powell in the head. Both Blaylock and Powell received immediate medical attention and survived the ordeal, despite the severity of their injuries. Powell's injuries would leave him with significant brain damage and partial paralysis, permanently altering his life, while Blaylock would recover from his throat wounds. But the trauma of the incident lingered. Despite his condition, Powell still faced additional charges for attempted escape and assault, adding to his existing convictions. His injuries also rendered him ineligible for parole, ensuring his continued incarceration. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, and other civil rights groups joined the ILD that year to form the Scottsboro Defense Committee, which reorganized the defense effort for the next set of retrials. As the case returned to the lower courts, tensions ran high. The prosecutors retried Haywood Patterson, Clarence Norris, and several others. But this time, the outcomes were different. As at the year 1946, four of the Scottsboro boys, Ozzie Powell, Willie Robertson, Olin Montgomery, and Eugene Williams, were finally acquitted, their names cleared of the false accusations. However, others were not as fortunate. Five defendants, Haywood Patterson, Clarence Norris, Andy Wright, Charles Weems, and Leroy Wright, would receive reduced sentences. Though no longer facing death sentences, they would languish still behind bars, their youth slipping away before their eyes. Years passed by, filled with relentless appeals and heartfelt petitions. The case of the Scottsboro Boys would become a rallying cry for civil rights activists who would continue ardently to push for justice. The back and forth would not stop. Now this is the year 1947. The Alabama Board of Pardons and Paroles would review the case of the Scottsboro Boys, citing the overwhelming evidence of racial bias and wrongful conviction found. This review, coupled with mounting public pressure and advocacy efforts, would pave the way for a significant development. And in 1943 and 1944, Alabama Governor Chauncey Sparks would grant parole to Haywood Patterson, Andy Wright, and Charles Weems, citing the overwhelming evidence of racial bias and wrongful conviction that had mounted since their initial trials. This landmark decision was made possible by relentless appeals and petitions from civil rights activists. However, two years onward being 1948, Haywood Patterson, frustrated enough, would attempt to escape from prison but he would be caught and arrested again. He would die shortly after, while still in prison. As a condition of their parole, Andy Wright and Charles Weems would be asked to leave Alabama at once, leaving behind loved ones and familiar surroundings. Fortunately for the duo, activist groups like the NAACP and the Scottsboro Defense Committee offered vital assistance, relocating them to new states, providing new identities, and helping them secure employment. Two of the boys, Clarence Norris and Leroy Wright, would be denied parole due to their initial convictions for rape and assault, although this has been proven false long ago. 
the prosecution had deemed their crimes more severe and the parole board deemed them higher risk candidates. Both boys would remain incarcerated, their freedom seemingly elusive. Despite the progress made in their case, they would be trapped behind bars, still being victims of a flawed justice system. The years would drag on, filled with endless days of monotony, hardship, and despair. Their hopes for release had been raised and dashed multiple times, leaving them emotionally drained. Frustrated by the slow pace of justice and overwhelmed by the prospect of spending more years behind bars, Clarence Norris reached a breaking point. Feeling hopeless and desperate, he would make the bold decision to escape from prison later that same year of 1948, that Haywood Patterson had died earlier after being rearrested trying to escape. In a daring move, Clarence Norris would successfully break free and navigate the treacherous path to freedom, avoiding the authorities who sought to reclaim him. Once safely settled in New York, he would assume a new identity and begin to rebuild his life, leaving the painful memories of his imprisonment behind. Leroy Wright, however, was not as fortunate. Left alone in the prison, he faced the harsh realities of solitary confinement with isolation and loneliness, taking a devastating toll on his mental and physical health. Wright kept a Bible with him at all times in jail. He needed whatever comfort he could find. In a letter to his mother, whom he had been snatched away from since he was a little teenager, he wrote, I am all lonely and thinking of you. I feel like I can eat some of your cooking, mom. With years of unjust imprisonment weakening his body and spirit, making him more susceptible to illness, the harsh realities of incarceration had taken a profound toll on Leroy Wright, leaving him physically frail, emotionally scarred, scared, and intensely struggling to reconcile with his youth. After finally being paroled in 1957, Leroy struggled to adapt to life outside prison walls, but the trauma and scars of his incarceration lingered. The psychological scars, too, ran deep. His post-release life was marked by hardship and struggle, ultimately culminating in his tragic passing in 1959, at an age far too young. In 1976, nearly two decades after the release of Leroy Wright, Clarence Norris would finally receive his long overdue pardon. Alabama Governor George Wallace, once a staunch segregationist, officially cleared Norris's name, acknowledging the state's grave injustice. In his pardon to the Alabama governor, George Wallace, Clarence Norris wrote, My name is Clarence Norris, one of the Scottsboro boys. I was arrested in Alabama in 1931 and sentenced to the electric chair three times. The governor commuted my sentence to life in prison. I was released on parole twice, once in 1944, and I broke my parole and went back to prison until I got out in 1946. I broke my parole again and I have been free ever since. I want to know if Alabama still wants me. With Norris's pardon, the heart-wrenching saga of the Scottsboro Boys would finally draw to a close. The Scottsboro Boys' legacy extends far beyond their individual struggles. Their case galvanized the civil rights movement, inspiring activists like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. to challenge systemic inequality. Today, their story stands as a poignant reminder of America's ongoing quest for true justice and equality. This would bring us to the end of yet another thought-provoking video segment. If you found this video informative and engaging, support our endeavors by hitting the thumb button, sharing this important piece of history with friends and families to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative, and consider subscribing also to our channel if you're yet to. Thank you for staying with us till the very end. Your support helps us bring more hidden stories to light and educate people worldwide. Together, let's keep history alive and promote social justice. See you in the next video.